or good evening. On behalf of the U.S. Ukraine Foundation, uh, my name is Nadia McConnell. I welcome you to today's very, very important discussion. I'm sure many of you have attended uh, one of the uh, almost daily uh, discussions and, and webinars on the topic of uh, Putin's uh, ongoing aggression towards Ukraine and what it means. But often lost in these discussions, I think, is the uh, the really the impact that it has on lives, human lives. You know, it's not a geopolitical chess game where countries are moving this or doing that. And so I think today's discussion, we will begin to uh, remedy that. Uh, and we couldn't have uh, anybody better than David Kramer to lead this discussion. David has spent his whole life uh, defending human rights uh, throughout the world. And fortunately for us, uh, always Ukraine has uh, been a part of his, of his work, uh, whether it, it was when he was under Secretary of State for Human Rights or when he was president of Freedom House, then uh, when he was teaching at Florida International University. And now most recently, he is uh, joining the Bush um, Center. And so uh, he is probably the most qualified person to uh, lead this discussion with our three participants. Additionally, we are taking this opportunity to profile three of our, the foundation's 2021 stars of Ukraine. Last year, in, uh, we uh, asked for nominations for stars of Ukraine. This was not a competition and it was not a contest. We were just asking for people to nominate uh, people who within the 30 years of independence through their body of work uh, contributed to building uh, an important image of Ukraine. And also, so we said that we would take uh, each month this year and profile three of the 30 stars that we had announced in uh, December. And so today we have with us, and David will give more uh, introductions, Miroslav Maranovich, Sidhi Zadan, and uh, Stanislav Aseyev. And now I will, oh, one more thing. I will, uh, in terms of the discussions about human rights and, and an important element of this, if you didn't watch last Friday, I urge you to go to our website and see the discussion that David Kramer had with Paul Goebel. Uh, it was entitled Oppression Within Russia uh, and the Aggression Against Ukraine Are Intertwined. And again, that was a very important discussion about human rights abuses. So without further ado, David, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Nadia, thank you very much. Thanks to you and the whole U.S. Ukraine Foundation. I'm really honored to be back with you for three outstanding uh, figures um, to, to lead our discussion. Let me just tell our audience uh, at the bottom of your screen on Zoom, you see Thank an you. option for interpretation. So if you don't understand me, um, go to Ukrainian. And if you won't understand our three Ukrainians, please use the English button on the interpretation. Um, so it, it is a real honor for me to be here talking about this important subject the human toll that, that is, is being exacted on Ukrainians, um, on Crimean Tatars, on ethnic Russians even. Um, and it's important to examine uh, what has happened already since Russia's first invasion in 2014, an ongoing aggression. This is not a frozen conflict. Um, and to also think about the possibility should Mr. Putin send more Russian forces across the border and the toll that that might bring about. So let me introduce our three outstanding speakers. Our, our third one will join us shortly, uh, but we will start first with Stanislav Vaseyev, who is a writer and journalist from Donbass, who has authored numerous unbiased reports about the on the ground reality in occupied Donbass with many media outlets in Ukraine, in June 2017, he sadly was kidnapped and unlawfully imprisoned by militants in the so-called Donetsk People's Republic, the DPR, uh, where he spent 32 months being brutally and routinely tortured. He was released 
as part of a prisoner's exchange and handed over to Ukrainian authorities in December 2019. And we are honored that he is joining us here today. Also with us is Dr. Miroslav Miranovich, Vice Rector and Professor of Ukrainian Catholic University, a former prisoner of conscience himself, who spent 10 years in the Soviet Gulag. He is widely recognized as one of Ukraine's leading public intellectuals and one of its most respected moral authorities. He was a charter member of the Ukrainian Helsinki Committee and continues to pursue creative means to promote human rights, freedom of religion, interfaith dialogue, and reforms to help Ukraine overcome the, overcome the crippling psychological legacy of Soviet rule. And he is author of the recently published book, The Universe Behind Barbed Wire, Memoirs of a Soviet Ukrainian Dissident. And joining us shortly will be Sergei Jadan, a prominent Ukrainian poet and writer and a winner of the U.S. Derek Walcott Prize for Poetry in 2021. In December 2019, the Penn Literary, uh, America Literary Awards shortlisted his work tra and translated poetry, uh, What We Live For, What We Die For, and that was included in the New York Times book list as well. He's a civic activist since his student years in the 1990s and co-founded the uh, Sergei Jadan Charitable Foundation to provide humanitarian aid to frontline cities. So without further ado, uh, let me ask each of our speakers uh, to offer a few brief uh, comments to get us started. Uh, again, please use the interpretation button if you so need, and also feel free to send questions into the Q&A function, and we will do our best to get to those uh, in, in a little bit. So Stanislav, please, if you don't mind, let's start with you. Thank you so much, Mr. Kramer. First of all, I would like to thank uh, for this uh, special distinction, for the honor to be present at this meeting and uh, generally uh, to be involved uh, in this event and uh, taking part in it. Now, as far as my introductory message, I would like first of all emphasize this. Now, now that uh, you can look at me and at Mr. Marinovich uh, in the same conversation, this uh, indicates that something is happening in the post-Soviet uh, space, in the post-Soviet countries, uh, telling us that the past is still with us. I'm talking of the Soviet past, because there still are uh, prison camps and there are tortures and there are prisoners of conscience. As you said correctly, I was state in the occupied territory since 2014. Donetsk is my native city, that's my homeland. So uh, in 2015, I began to collaborate with a whole bunch of Ukrainian media. First and foremost, it was uh, the Ukrainian Office of Radio Liberty. I uh, produced many reports for them, but I also worked for others such as Weekly Mirror and Ukrainska Pravda. And of course, I was using a pen name because no Ukrainian journalists remain there and it certainly would uh, have been uh, dangerous to work there, but even under a pen name it became dangerous. However, I was able to continue doing this for two years until, uh, until May 2017 and then all of a sudden while I was uh, producing another report for Radio Liberty I was uh, seized in uh, downtown Donetsk after I had taken my pictures and was going home to write uh, the text and send it to the editorial office I was first uh, detained by a local police patrol, but then individuals in civilian clothes showed up, uh, who, as it turned out, were uh, officers of local security service. And that's how my two and a half years in captivity began. I stayed there for 31 months in captivity. Out of those, 28 months were spent in a place which is now uh, notoriously well known became a signature uh, uh, place named Isolation. 
uh, formerly a factory, uh, Soviet time factory, which has turned now into a concentration camp. During the 28 months I spent there, I was a witness to many military crimes, crimes of war that included uh, electric current torture, that included uh, rapes of uh, prisoners, that also was various other uh, undignified treatment, beating, uh, forced labor, and even uh, murders. We could see how some of the prisoners had been killed. Unfortunately, this place is still uh, in operation, and despite all our efforts, we have not been able to force the Russian Federation to at least shut down this particular facility. Of, it's by far not the only uh, torture place of torture in that occupied territory. So after I got uh, liberated, I uh, quickly wrote a book about my experiences in that cap captivity and the isolation uh, prison. And while I actually was imprisoned, I uh, had a book published uh, with uh, my reports, uh, which came out uh, recently at Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. I was there for a presentation. So I have spent my uh, most recent two years to tell people in Ukraine and outside Ukraine about this place and uh, in fact uh, this is the reason why the book uh, got translated into English, French, and German, and I uh, had to present uh, these writings in those countries. Stanislav, thank you very much, and let me just mention the name. It's called The Torture Camp on Paradise Street. So. Uh, thank you so much for, for your comments, and we're, again, very grateful that you are here with us today and salute your, your courage, your perseverance, um, and hope that you never, ever experience what you went through again, and I hope no one else will either. Um, Miroslav, if I can, please, let me, let me turn to you next. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me first um, thank the U.S.-Ukraine Foundation. Uh, first for awarding me with this prestigious title, but also for uh, creating this one more platform to discuss the threat of the uh, Russian aggression, invasion into Ukraine and human rights uh, situation in eastern part of, of Ukraine. Uh, we, we were lacking such platforms a few months ago even. <clears throat> so my personal expertise in this narrow topic is limited because I didn't visit the region by my own recently. By the way, I visited uh, Donetsk um, one month before the, the final occupation and I had a talk uh, in isolation in this place uh, Stanislav just mentioned. Uh, and there, were, there was a huge, uh, excellent community of people who were eager to listen to me. And I spoke the same as I was in uh, Lviv. Uh, so for me, it's very clear that this, uh, uh, um, that besides all regional differences in Ukraine, uh, it was Russia who reshaped that difference uh, uh, controversies into the military conflict. So for me, this is very important. And I witnessed that speaking to local uh, people. But when we speak about human rights abuses now, uh, I have a feeling that the uh, Russian actors now are acting according to the old manuals. Everything is the same. I spoke with several people who were prisoners of Kremlin, of the Kremlin recently, and they, wit they are witnessing the, the, the following, that this is the uh, um, strong human rights abuses committed by uh, Russian military and other people. 
And uh, for me, this is very important psychological phenomena um, because uh, it seems to me uh, that uh, uh, when, when uh, these Russian actors uh, speak with Ukrainians, uh, they consider Ukrainians to be the fascists or banderites. And if they say that these people are enemies, they feel free, they feel being free from any moral obligations. And then awful human rights violations took place because these people are not uh, uh, people already, human beings. These people are our enemies and that's all. <laughs> and all morality stops here. So for me, this is reincarnation of the former Stalinist approach to uh, any person who the power, communist power, considers to be an enemy. Uh, then it is an, um, just the object of any possible uh, cruelties. Um, unfortunately, local people uh, uh, find themselves in, in, in some difficult uh, trap be between uh, two sides uh, and uh, I may even imagine uh, how difficult the life is uh, because of, of, of that. Um, of course, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's ironic uh, that uh, Russia speaks about defending uh, of Russian uh, speaking population. But so many Ukrainian soldiers who are fighting with the Russians speak Russian. <laughs> so this notion, notion of defending Russian speaking population is nonsense. Plus uh, humanitarian needs of local people are enormous. And if Russia wants to support the Russian people population, it has to do that for in, immediately for these people who are under its control. Uh, so, um, probably I'll stop. Uh, sure. I, I cannot question the possible situation when some people in the eastern part of Ukraine blame the Ukrainian government for something. First of all, this is the natural criticism of all periphery regions in Ukraine toward the central Kyiv government. The slogan is, Kyiv doesn't hear us. So I may imagine that some people are um, uh, critical toward Kyiv government, but it doesn't mean that they are ready to fight, they are ready to use violence against Ukraine. Miroslav, thank you very much. I, I want to pick up on that last point you made and bring in Stanislav as well, and it also reflects a question that we received from one of our viewers too. Uh, the viewer asked Stanislav, in your opinion, what percentage of people in Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast are loyal to Ukraine? What is happening to those loyal Ukrainians now? And Miroslav, you mentioned you were there a month before war broke out. Um, as you both know, Western journalists and Western, some Western journalists and some Western commentators rather carelessly and sloppily use the term separatists in describing these regions. Could you address that issue and the issue of loyalty uh, for people in these regions, please? Uh, Stanislav, why don't we start with you and then Miroslav? 
We need to understand that in the occupied territory, I'm speaking of just the occupied parts of Donetsk and Luhansk provinces, what we have there is uh, a classical totalitarian uh, regime. So when we talk about percentages, then the question comes up, is it possible to do an adequate sociological uh, survey in those conditions? Of course not. And and uh, if people get imprisoned for five years in my 15 years uh, sentence, five years were given for writing Donetsk People's Republic in uh, inverted commas. Now, if you ask people in downtown, do you expect Ukraine to come back? No one will certainly say, uh, give you a, uh, no one will give you a truthful answer because, of course, they can be locked up for uh, with charges of extremism. But but there are other numbers, uh, indicators, which reflect what people really think. First of all, in that territory, according to different calculations, there are 30 or 35,000 uh, 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 soldiers, those who serve uh, for the Russian-funded military. So if you are an officer in that uh, Army Corps number one, you probably have a pro Russian uh, view. And if you multiply that by their two or three members of their families, uh, these individuals will typically support those uh, servicemen, those uh, uh, warriors. And then there are uh, government uh, security uh, agencies, ministries, and uh, all in all, they employ about eight to ten thousand uh, individuals. Plus, uh, there are other government agencies uh, that um, provide political components of the regime. So if we add all those numbers together, uh, and the people who most likely have uh, pro-Russian views, that means three or four hundred thousand local residents are not loyal or, uh, or feel like enemies of Ukraine. Plus, we need to understand that 600,000 Russian passports have been issued in those territories. Until recently, those um, uh, Russian passports were not required locally, which means uh, this is also a political statement in a sort of way. The government forced people to get passports of uh, the occupied administration, but, but they um, did not require a Russian passport. Now, numbers uh, may vary about the total uh, amount of people still still living there. Some say there may be up to 3 million, some say around 2, but most likely the number is 2.5, 2.7 million. So out of those, if you figure out that 600,000 are anti-Ukrainian without any sociological surveys of just uh, people on the street, uh, there are uh, college students, there are um, uh, school students, there are uh, pensioners, retired people, and think of those young men, uh, they now are required to wear pioneer ties and uh, uh, march in front of the Dzerzhinsky statue in Donetsk. I'm afraid uh, there wouldn't be too many pro-Ukrainian individuals there right now. They probably will make up a minority, but it's very hard, it's impossible to measure that uh, um, quantity. So Miroslav, if I can turn the question to you too, and if you could address this issue that there was no real push for separatism in these regions. This came about because of Russia trying to instigate this and Russian forces on the ground trying to promote this. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, let me uh, uh, compare the situation with Belgium. There are controversies in Belgium about uh, languages. So uh, is there uh, any war between people? No. This is controversies trying to, uh, 
to make influence on uh, to defend uh, themselves and so on but it's not uh, uh, fighting but now imagine that france would support francophone uh, belgians support military then you have that the, the situation that we have in ukraine in the eastern part of ukraine um, so for me this is absolutely clear that without russia these controversies would never tr be transformed into the military uh, conflict uh, the, the first one then uh, the, the next point i totally support stanislav's uh, um, point about a totalitarian uh, atmosphere uh, regime in eastern part uh, in in occupied uh, territories uh, <clears throat> no human rights no uh, free expression of people so uh, for me this is the reason the reason why i uh, am so critical toward the minsk agreement because uh, russia wants um uh, elections to be held immediately under the totalitarian state <laughs> so um, sometimes i cannot understand the western our western allies who insist on that just in order to to find the golden mean between uh, the, the russian and ukrainian uh, position but there is no golden mean in this sense because there are some uh, um, preconditions of normal democratic elections. And this precondition presupposes that our, con the Ukrainian control over uh, these occupied territories is restored, is restored for a certain period, not immediately elections. So uh, I, I'm sure that uh, this uh, uh, inter Russian interpretation of the situation is absolutely false. Thank you both very much for that. I, I want to bring in a question that we received um, from someone who registered, uh, Roman Serban, uh, Serban, I believe. Um, and Stanislav, I'll start with you if I can. He asks, um, in the occupied territories, and he includes Crimea. Our conversation so far has mostly been about Donetsk and Luhansk, but of course Crimea is occupied as well. He says in those territories, there is an ongoing process of Russification and Russianization. He claims this is genocide according to the UN uh, convention. Why are Ukrainian intellectual elites and the Ukrainian government not raising this issue perhaps more loudly than they have. They've raised it, but not not perhaps enough. Uh, Miroslav, you want to start and then Stanislav? No, 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 no. I, I didn't get the... the, the... What, what, why, why are you, uh, Ukrainian leaders and intellectual figures not making, according to this question that came in, that this is this in a person's interpretation, why are they not making a bigger issue internationally about russification of these occupied territories including with passportization denial of of religious rights freedom of expression do you agree with the the viewer that there is not enough being raised about the human rights situation uh, and the efforts by russia to impose its system on these territories by ukrainian authorities well it's very obvious uh, that uh these issues needs to be uh, highlighted uh, i uh, agree because every every time we may say that that we do not do enough for attracting attention to uh, of the international community to this fact yes of course uh, we try to do but uh, um, you know uh, it was very difficult uh, for Ukrainians uh, until recently uh, to convince some people uh, abroad about all these issues uh, because the world considered the crisis as an inner crisis of Ukraine. It's, 
uh, and Ukraine fatigue, uh, and, and nobody wanted to listen um, uh, our people when we are well witnessing about these human rights atrocities. Now, only now the West starts to understand that this is not the problem of Ukraine, that this is the problem of the, of the whole world. And now it is uh, much easier for, for us to, now there is a, uh, uh, oh, I forgot the, the word, uh, now there is an attention of the world to, to that. Uh, Stanislav, if you have anything you want to add on that, and then I'll, I'll turn to Sergei who's, who's joined us. So uh, Stanislav, if you have anything you want on that. I will answer this very uh, shortly. Uh, all our listeners need to understand that we now have a catastrophic situation with uh, hostages in the occupied territories, especially in the uh, Donbas area, but in the Crimea as well. Why? Because individuals who uh, were uh, captured by these local so-called security agencies and are kept in those uh, basements, torture prisons, 99% uh, of them go through uh, electric current torture. Think of this, 99%, that means it's not um, some uh, uh, single instances. People are stripped naked, tied, to, tied up to a um, table, and then electric wires are applied to different parts of their bodies. This this, among other things, certainly shapes up the agenda of Ukraine in the international uh, stage. After so many years, we have not been able to stop that from happening. What you're talking about, such as giving out Russian passports and uh, bans on Ukrainian uh, language, that's a totally different paradigm. Uh, all those messages about Ukraine having no right to existence. Um, that's that's one thing, but uh, speaking of the tortures that continue against uh, captured Ukrainians, that's a much uh, more acute issue that needs to be addressed, and of course the Ukrainian government perhaps uh, still needs to get a clear understanding of what Russification is and what's happening in the cultural domain there. Stanislav, thank you very much. Um, uh, so he, I'm going to turn to you in one second. William Myers had sent in a question that I think um, I will try to answer it, but my, my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong. He asks, um, many people have left the region as refugees to other parts of Ukraine. How many are left? And Stanislav, I think you said there are about 2.7 million people still in the Donetsk and Luhansk areas controlled by Russia. But then, of course, there's uh, roughly... 2 million, I believe, uh, uh, in Crimea as well that, that need to be considered. Um, if that sounds right to you, uh, to, to all of you. Um, okay, based on, on what I have Sergei. seen and the information I uh, have available, it is difficult to describe a, some kind of an objective picture. But one way or another, I think it is clear that uh, what's happening in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk are uh, tendencies uh, are uh, troublesome tendencies in the sphere of humanitarian issues and also uh, human rights. Uh, some of uh, my network activists talk to graduates of the medical school in Donetsk and uh, those individuals have stayed in the occupied territory. Uh, they speak about a humanitarian catastrophe. This is a big problem. We, again, we don't have a full objective picture with uh, data. Clearly, the official information from uh, the um, from the authorities there is not reliable, but uh, that's what I can say. We it's hard for us to even guess what's going on in reality. 
But uh, I heard what Stanislav was saying about uh, Ukraine government's uh, humanitarian policy. Uh, in the territories adjoining war zone. So I want to say yes, indeed, those are very important issues. We may have different uh, perspectives on this. So one may speak about how much uh, was failed to be accomplished, including uh, the sphere of public information. But on the other hand, we can see how much has been done and how much is being done. There have been new civic initiatives and projects, and we can see how people in the east, uh, those uh, regions of eastern Ukraine, more and more people are joining uh, so-called public life and uh, various projects and initiatives. They are trying to, to do that. It is a very interesting situation. We need to understand that uh, as, uh, as of 2014, at that time, this was a very closed uh, part of Ukraine. Not much was... Um, uh, th th there were very few contacts with that region. But now we see the situation changing, and I hope those trends, those positive trends, will remain. But let's also keep in mind that here we are talking about uh, Donetsk and Luhansk uh, provinces where um, the war zone is uh, located. Uh, those two regions, part of them, uh, part of them is occupied by uh, the Russian But in Ukraine, people often forget that there are other uh, parts of Ukraine, such as the Kharkiv province. And over there, the situation in some ways might even be worse than in Luhansk, if you compare. Because in the Kharkiv Oblast, nobody really pays attention to this, and uh, there are no legal ways to uh, re uh, restrict Russian propaganda. A Russian television is fully accessible uh, from homes. Plus, unlike Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, there are uh, way fewer humanitarian or uh, public uh, civic initiatives in uh, Kharkiv. What does it tell us? It tells us that there's still a lot for us to do. And once again, we can uh, evaluate this in very different ways. We can talk about this as a big problem. The problems are real indeed. But I can also uh, point Он out the tr tremendous а, potential that can be realized and we can put efforts to achieve it. Maybe my answer is not totally about human rights, but uh, uh, because I'm talking about uh, issues of humanitarian policy in general. So, uh, and I compare that in the as as it is in the occupied territories and in the territories controlled by Kyiv. I believe that this is a tremendously important component. Perhaps uh, political discourses pay don't pay much attention to it. People often fail to talk about it when they emphasize uh, combat uh, develop, uh, developments in, in, in the war zone. But this is largely the reality that we will be facing once the war comes to an end. This is something we will have to deal with and uh, it's uh, unavoidable because this really shapes the attitudes of local residents. So I think it's uh, tremendously important to start addressing this, start planning what we'll need to do, realizing that the war will come to an end one day. I understand that today 
what with the possible escalation of the invasion threat. It may be hard, uh, may, may seem strange that we would be talking about the war coming to an end soon. Still, I think it's very important uh, to make a humanitarian situation a priority. These are our territories, those occupied territories, they are ours. Those are uh, our people, our citizens, who are now hostages of the Kremlin authority. Uh, and that includes the people that Stanislav was talking about it. Oh, in fact, all those people are prisoners of the Kremlin regime. But I think still it's very important to remember that prison, the prisoners and the hostages are first and foremost the civilian population who are not even in the prison camps but are still uh, staying in the occupied territories. So let's uh, call things uh, what they are. Uh, the people on that side are terrorists. Uh, the people with uh, firearms who control the territory and keep the civilians as hostages. Sugi, Diakou, um, I, I want you raised uh, Kharkiv, um, which we have not discussed yet. I also want to work in I hope you can uh, hear the interpretation. Um, uh, I want to work in two questioners who raise the issue of Crimea. Um, one, uh, Mubian Altan says he's deeply concerned with the status of the Crimean Tartars in the occupied Crimea. Um, Deputy Chairman of the Majlis, Nariman Jalal and others have been imprisoned unjustly um, would someone address this issue? And Sarah Farnsworth also asks, do you think that part of Putin's strategy is to try to connect the occupied territory of Crimea to Donetsk? So if anyone could address the human rights situation there and also um, the, the strategy behind Putin, uh, what he may be up to. Yeah. The issue of Crimea Tatars uh, is uh, again uh, <clears throat> of high importance because this nation now is uh, forcefully actually uh, taking off of Crimea. So there is a, a, a very difficult choice. You may stay in Crimea, but then you are under permanent threat and you may disappear without any sign. You may be arrested unjustfully uh, and many people are were arrested. So this is one option to stay, but be under the uh, sword of democracy. But there is the other option is to be deported again, to, to leave Crimea, their land. And this, uh, any choice is very difficult. Every choice is very, uh, has uh, um, very important consequences for the fate of uh, Crimea Tatars. So uh, I strongly support uh, the all people who defend Crimea Tatars uh, during this uh, crisis. I, uh, for example, I would like to mention, uh, along with Nariman just mentioned, I would like to mention uh, also uh, um, Server Mustafayev, who is a human rights activist. So it's a repetition of the former Soviet policy. You cannot be Crimea Tatar and human rights defender because now you immediately are announced as a terrorist and, and, uh, in, in, uh, uh, under Russian uh, Crimea. Uh, so so uh, all these people 
um, Crimea Tatars who are uh, in jail now are innocent. Uh, I'm sure, and uh, I strongly appeal to the world community uh, not to forget about Crimea, because sometimes uh, uh, politicians, uh, recently uh, big uh, German uh, military uh, actor, uh, spoke that Crimea is uh, taken to Russia forever. So I, I ask the world not to agree with that. I ask the world to support Crimea Tatars and their right to live safely on their native land. Miroslav, thank you. And I, I'll turn to Stanislav for any comments on this, but just also remind people that the United States and, and the West never uh, recognized the incorporation of the Baltic states into the Soviet Union. And that took decades for them to return to independent status. And one other point, Miroslav, you mentioned earlier, the Minsk agreement. Of course, the Minsk agreement does not deal with Crimea, which is another uh, part of why it is so uh, such a misguided uh, uh, effort. Um, Stanislav, anything on Crimea you would like to say, please? Uh, this, in fact, is a dream of Vladimir Putin to separate the issues of Crimea and the issue of Donbass. Not simply to separate, but um, his position is uh, to say that the uh, Crimean issue is closed, it's no longer an issue. As for Donbass, uh, Russia uh, allegedly is not a side to the conflict, so they want to be a mediator. But our uh, position of Ukraine is to discuss those two cases as one and the same act of Russian aggression. Donbass became an extension of what was happening in uh, what had happened in the Crimea. Uh, and, and I mean not just um, the Kremlin, but I speak of specific individuals who executed the orders from the Kremlin, those uh, private military companies, the same officers of Russian intelligence. They first operated in the Crimea and later they went to operate in uh, what is now occupied territories of Donbas. So my personal position um, is consistent with the government uh, perspective. Uh, there's, there can be no other view. It is one and the same occupation of uh, Russian Federation. When somebody says, don't uh, even think about returning Crimea back, well, I am a pragmatic, uh, pragmatically thinking person, and I realize that maybe this will not happen in my lifetime, because as long as Vladimir Putin is in uh, at power, and it's not just himself individually, but the people, the circle. Uh, as long as they are there, it will be hard to return to Crimea in any ways. But again, I want to remind you that such a huge monster as the Soviet Union collapsed and broke apart on its own. Nobody was uh, using uh, nuclear weapons against it. So empires fall apart and this peninsula will come back to Ukraine. It's a question when. Stanislav, thank you. Uh, Sugi, I, I don't know if you're still connected with us, if you can uh, hear me. Anything on Crimea? Um, and, and a few other people had asked about the situation in Crimea. Uh, Maria Malanchuk asked about uh, psychiatric abuses in the Crimean prisons. Uh, Roman uh, Servan asked, uh, is, isn't this genocide that's happening to Crimean Tatars? Um, so we only have five minutes left. Um, let me give each, unfortunately, I think we lost Sergei, um, but uh, uh, Stanislav and Miroslav, let me just give you a few minutes each for any, any final thoughts, messages that you think are important for our listeners to hear and to leave with about how, how critical these human rights issues are. Uh, please, go, uh, what, uh, Stanislav, why don't we start with you? And Miroslav will will close with you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I always say that 
I always say that when we talk about such things as the isolation, the isolation prison or tortures, this is no longer about uh, political differences between the Ukrainian position and the Russian position, but this is about uh, just uh, anti-human uh, behavior, which is uh, destructive against a human personality. This is something that had started back in the Soviet times and continues under Russian Federation. So when we speak about uh, today's Russia, it is the same uh, country of Lenin, Stalin and Khrushchev, uh, which has not disappeared. And as you mentioned, uh, repressive psychiatry, it also was one component of uh, the Russian system. Uh, nothing has changed except they added uh, electric current torture in the basement prisons of Donetsk, Luhansk, or, and also the Crimea. These are the same things that uh, the West needs to understand. This is not an issue between Ukraine and Russia. This is an issue between the world of freedom, uh, the West, and the world of tyranny, now represented by Putin and the Russian Federation with their efforts to bring back the Soviet Union Stanislav, yes, thank you so much. That was very well said. I appreciate your your comments and your joining us uh, today. Miroslav, please, uh, final thoughts. Let me start from one moment. A few years ago, I was in Belgium and uh, uh, I and Mykola Repchuk, one more Ukrainian intellectual, uh, labeled Putin as uh, Hitler and the Putin's regime as Nazi regime. Uh, there was one lady who opposed uh, against that and she, she said, oh, we have to, uh, to think, we have to understand that the Russians have their sensibility and we do not have to speak in these terms. But we are sorry, <laughs> but do Ukrainians and Crimea Tatars have their sensitivity? What about those people who are tortured right now at this moment when we speak about, uh, well, both sides are guilty because we now live in a modern world. We understand that Ukrainians are not ideal, so we have to uh, so confirm the responsibility of both Russians and Ukrainians. But please understand that Ukrainians do not have isolation concentration camp. And we do not use tortures uh, against Russians. So there is a difference and all these moral and human rights issues have to be addressed on political level as well. They have to be the agenda for Minsk conversation, for Norman, uh, Normandy conversation, and so on. So uh, I agree with Stanislav that we have to put these issues on the first uh, level of our attention. Miroslav, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your participation today. My apologies to Sergei and to our viewers for the difficulties we had in connecting with him. Um, I'll just mention two final things before we go. Uh, Miroslav, you, you, you mentioned the comparisons to World War II. And these days we hear German officials try to justify their refusal to provide military assistance to Ukraine so that it can defend itself out of a sense of guilt toward Russia. Um, of course, you know better than I, in percentage terms, there were more Ukrainians and frankly more Belarusians killed by the Nazis than there were Russians, not to minimize any of that. But if there's a sense of guilt, it should extend beyond simply the Russian borders. Um, lastly, as, as Nadia mentioned the session, I did last week with Paul Goebel, I think as we tried to make clear, 
um, the situation inside Russia is pretty appalling when it comes to human rights. And so we should not be shocked that when there are areas controlled by Russian authorities that the human rights situation in those areas is similarly appalling. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it argues even more for those regions, Donetsk, Luhansk, and Crimea, to be returned to Ukrainian control as soon as possible to uh, reduce and eliminate the suffering of the people in those three regions. Um, Nadia, thank you so much for putting this event together. Appreciate uh, you're asking me to join. It's been a, a, a real privilege and honor for me to be with uh, Stanislav and Miroslav and briefly with Sergei. Um, and uh, I thank all of you for, for watching here today and for sending in the questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them, um, but thank you again. I'm David Kramer, um, moderating today's session, and we will be back with more events. Nadia, over to you, please. Okay, again, yes, uh, David, thank you so much uh, for this uh, very important discussion. And of course, to Miroslav and Stanislav. And um, this, let's say that this is the beginning of our focus on, on these issues. Um, it's, it, it just is heartbreaking uh, to hear, you know, what Stanislav talks about. And, and of course, like we said at the very beginning, in these all these geopolitical discussions, the human uh, suffering seems to get lost. And uh, you all have done, I think, a wonderful job of, of bringing some light to that. And we will do more of that in the future. And so then we will get Sidhi back uh, and so for some of those uh, future discussions. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you to our participants uh, who st have stayed with us. And uh, till the next time, do pobacchina. Do pobacchina.